how do we get out of this uh, situation, Dr. Ayad Ray? Great question. Great question. You know, there's a very famous essay, and everyone listening should have the chance to go read this. It's called Two Cultures by a great um, uh, guy that I like called C.P. Snow. Uh, you may have read it. C.P. Snow was, um, I like him because I, I've always, I read it when I was in ninth grade, and I always wanted to be like him. That's why I think I, I did art and science. <laughs> C.P. Snow was a novelist, a very esteemed novelist, but he was also a physical chemist. Physical chemistry is a very tough subject. Mm -hmm. And C.P. Snow talked about that, 60, this is about 60 years ago, he'd go to these very highfalutin elitist parties. And he'd go to these parties, you know, these are all educated people. And he'd go to these parties and he'd ask people, how many of you know what the second law of thermodynamics is? Hmm. And they would look at him all upset that he would, how dare he ask him this? Now, in his mind, that was no different than asking, do you know Shakespeare? Hmm. Okay? Then he would, he would actually make it simpler. Can, how many can you tell me, how many of you can tell me the between force and acceleration or mass and acceleration? And they would even get more upset, but in his view, that was saying, do you know how to read? So what has happened is that here's a solution, but this is what we need to understand the real problem. What's happened is over the last 50, 60 years, everyone goes, gets a college degree. Okay. They're getting these certificates. They don't even know the second law of thermodynamics. They may not even know Shakespeare. They don't even learn physics. So we're graduating people with some degree and some weird, maybe humanities. I'm not against humanities. Uh, I love, you know, I love art and reading, et cetera, but they're not learning fundamentals. So, but you have people coming out who have learned how to rationalize anything because the modern academic model, remember the academics themselves rationalize anything. They get funded for rationalizing anything by and large. And it may be a little bit of a hyperbole, but their entire incentive is to say, of course, climate change is taking place. We must stop CO2. Of course, cannabis is safe because they're getting funding. Of course, we need genetically engineered foods. So you have a teacher who's teaching a bunch of students who himself is sucking up all day. So his students suck up to him. So you have students people pleasing. They don't question and they get their degrees. Echo chambers. Echo chambers. So, but these people think they're better than the average person, right? So they're saying, oh, of course climate change is talking about, what do you mean that CO2? How dare you say that? But the, the good news is this, you, you still have a few scientists left, but you have the everyday person, the average plumber, the average electrician, the average engineer who works hard, they can't BS, Sri, they can't rationalize because if I don't deliver a piece of software, my customers are going to leave me, okay? If a plumber goes in and he doesn't fix something, he's going to be liable. Right. The 50% of people who have seen through climate change or see things rationally, they're actually everyday people. They're not the indoctrinated, irrational people who think they're smarter. So what we have to understand the problem. What's happened is the academic world and the establishment has created educated idiots. Those group of educated idiots are used as soldiers to think they're better and fight against people who are real scientists and rationally thinking people. So once you understand that problem, you realize that the, the real way out of this is to force people to the scientific method. And you have to question people. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was a professor at BU, you know, nice spectacle glasses, he's, he's dressing the part. Um, he runs a center at BU, probably getting a lot of money for climate impact studies. He comes to Andover, which is a small town, very educated people in the library of 150 people. And he's telling them how disastrous this is going to be. And he puts up a slide which says the oceans are getting more acidic. Okay. And everyone's like, oh my God. And I'm in the audience and me being me knowing that they, they're never going to let me speak at the end. And knowing that I've had to, unfortunately, uh, be a disruptor, I say, look, that's a lie. I said, what is the pH of the ocean? Mm. And, he, and, he, and he stops. Because remember, basic chemistry, I had a great chemistry teacher. pH goes from 0 to 6.99999. That's acidic. 7 is neutral. 7.001 to 14 is what? Basic. Uh, yeah. Right? Okay. If I ever said that pH of 7.3 was acidic, I would get an F. Yes. That's All right. Anyone knows it. This guy is putting up a slide with SpongeBob Bob. You know, the oceans are getting more acidic. 
Now, to the average person who, like C.P. Snow pointed out, do not know chemistry, they don't learn physics, but they're all thinking they're so smart. When I say, what's the pH? They're like, the whole room becomes quiet. And he goes, uh, uh, uh. I go, how could the, I said, you said the oceans are getting more acidic. What is the pH of the oceans? And he said, well, they're basic, but they're getting less basic. I said, that's very different. <laughs> what he said is the word acidic has many connotations. It's a PR, it's public relations he's doing. Acidic means digestive acidity, right? These acidic people, is bad. <laughs> it's bad. But what I'm trying to say is, this is malevolent. What he's doing is malicious. It is using science in a malicious way because you're taking advantage of people knowing these people think they're so smart. So it's a very, I mean, it's up on, it's up on YouTube because eventually they call the police and they shut down the whole debate. <laughs> because how dare, and, and you know, I, and I have four degrees from MIT. I do research in this and this is basic chemistry. So what needs to happen is people need to challenge these people. Because an academic thinks it's like the old priesthood. I, I hate to say it, they're wearing their robes, you know, and therefore you cannot question them. And they need to be questioned because they're using our tax dollars. Your, they build their brands. That's why I hit San Petroda, you know? You know, your little goatee and your little hair, and then you go make deals with uh, Rahul Gandhi and you present yourself as though, and we'll come back to this, but I'm saying these people are involved Getting back to our original point, you have actual people busting their, you know, buns doing science, like those Danish researchers, 20 years. They proved it, they did the mathematics, and they prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And over here, you have academics. They're salespeople, they're flim-flam people. You know, like that Steve Martin movie, Flim Flam Man. They're like, that's what they're doing. So it's almost a church of climatology, the church of cannabis, the church of GMOs. And that's what we've created. And they are absolutely taking advantage of these people that they educate. The good news, I think that the, the good news is everyday people, Sri, the solution here is everyday people have a rational mind, you know? And um, th there's, a great, um, there's a great Washington Post article that was written, and, I, and it basically says, I, I, I tweeted, it says, you know, the, ice, I'm, I'm par the icebergs are melting. The uh, seals have no place to go, right? Blah, 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 blah. And, um, and if I were to ask a climate change person, they say, yeah, yeah, that's true. I go, do you know when that was written? That was written in 1922, okay? Mm -hmm. Published in the Washington Post. So look, the, an ice age did, a little ice age did, we, we're at a thawing of an ice age. There are other characteristics that are gonna you know, increase temperature. And the issue is we all agree CO2 has an effect, it's how much but putting everything on CO2 does the following. It alleviates, and this is a big distraction, Monsanto gets away, pollution gets away. Bringing, so get, bringing back, what should we really do with climate change? Focus on lowering pollution. Seven, the number one cause of death in the world is air pollution. Seven million people die every year. And the Paris Accords allowed China to pollute another 11 billion more tons. As of 2017, they were dumping 11.7 .7 billion tons. They get to pollute another 11 billion, Sri, until 2030. India gets to double its pollution. So think about it. So how is that lowering pollution? So they allow pollution increase, and guess who's one of the big people behind the CO2 hypothesis? Monsanto, okay? The, the fertilizers that they put out and the agrobiotech increases acidity, okay? We know this. But they're, they're all for CO2 because now they say we can create this crop, that crop, this genetically engineering. So it's very interesting to see the bees dying. I'm going to be doing a video on it. The bees are dying, not because of climate change, because of the neonicotinoids that they put around the seeds because the genetically engineered seeds are, seeds are inferior. They have less glutathione when they plant them. So the bees are actually being affected by neonicotinoids, which go everywhere. Thank you, Monsanto. So we don't, what's happening is when you take a single solution or a single reason, fake science, and then you build a whole narrative around it, you let the real criminals get away, the real problems. So we need to lower pollution. That's what we need to focus on. We should be using less plastic. That's not a bad thing, right? But lead, sulfur dioxide, you know, China's putting more and more of that out. India's putting more and more of that out, right? In Delhi. Right. right. The issue is to lower pollution.
Yeah, it's a problem that affects us all. Uh, Dr. Ayadre, I have a, a question off the left field here. How many scientists are there in the Congress today? Wow, I think there's one microbiologist. How many senators? I don't think, I think you could probably put Rand Paul, who's a, you know, he's a, I think he's a MD, ophthalmologist. Okay. So, so they're not that they're not well represented, and I think that is maybe and the years. You know, and people act. Yeah, exactly. Right. And the reason, and 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 look, um, it's a very important question you're asking. The founders of the country, right? They were scientists, architects, engineers. I mean, think about Franklin, right? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Farmers. I mean, George Washington could not. He wasn't. He was excited to get back and do farming. Farming is not easy. You have to understand a, many, a lot of different dynamics, science, weather patterns, you can be a meteorologist, all different kinds of things. And what's happened is you essentially have people who got into this entire world of politics who should not even be there. So when you look at a guy like a Rahul Gandhi, who was a cokehead, you know, couldn't make it through Harvard, right? <laughs> These are the character of people we're allowing in. Yes. And people really need to wonder they need to wonder, what is it you want? Do you want a guy like Shiva Ayadure representing you? Or do you want a guy like Rahul Gandhi? Do you want a guy like Modi who's actually done work for a living, right? right. He does not come from a dynasty. <laughs> He's not perfect, but he doesn't come from dynasty. Yes. Rahul Gandhi's mama and papa, you know, Sonia Gandhi, back to Rajiv Gandhi, back to Indira Gandhi, back to Nehru, right? Yes. Yeah, it's total BS. <laughs> and the fact that we even accept that, that this guy's even being entertained, um, is, is what the real issue is. And the real issue comes down to people waking up from their own slumbers and recognizing that they are a force, that one person, like I stood up in that Andover library and asked this guy who had, you know, tries to make himself appear as though he's, you know, he's a scientist, right? <laughs> so... I think it's about people having the gumption to wake up and recognize what is the meaning of life. The meaning of life is that each person should recognize that you are, a, if you want to get spiritual about this, you, you matter, your voice matters, and what um, the future of this world is what we create. Sir, uh, to wrap up this debate, what are your future plans, Dr. Ayadre? Do you plan on running for House or Senate again? Yeah, I'm going to run in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are going to run, again, with the independent concept, we're going to run uh, w uh, as a Democrat. Because this is what we realized. If you go to the full conclusion, both parties work together, right? There is no difference. I ran as a Republican. I gave them a shot, but they don't believe in meritocracy. And in fact, the Republican Party of Massachusetts revolves around the Democratic Party. They're basically like Mercury going around the sun. <laughs> Whatever the Democrats say, they do. Mm -hmm. We ran then as independents. We got all of our votes, like you said at the outset. We got all of our signatures. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we didn't even pay for one signature, Sri. The mm -hmm. other party candidates buy signatures. We, you know, people were out there in weather and cold weather collecting signatures. I was one of three candidates. It wasn't like there were 20 candidates. Right. You know, about 20 years ago, they had an independent running, a white guy. Okay. I'm not saying it's white or black, but it's interesting. And he was allowed on the debate stage. An independent. <laughs> and he was polling at less than 1%. I was 10% or more, and I had close to 50%, 60% visibility. So the fact that I wasn't allowed on the debate stage, it's not just a conspiracy. Both parties collude, period. Correct. It is collusion. So, so what we're saying is, given that's the same, the belly of the beast is a Democratic Party. So I'm going to run right, I'm going to go right into the belly of the beast. And, you know, I'm an immigrant. I'm a minority. I've been pro-worker, I've been pro-green. Who better, that's the classical liberal, social conservative, true Democrat. So why not go into them and expose their hypocrisy and win on their terms, go right into the belly of the beast. It's a natural conclusion we've come to. So, um, so I'm gonna be running in 2020, anyone listening, you know, go up and donate if you wanna volunteer. But the important part is that we're at a very important po point in human history is that Beyond, I think what Trump did, Sri, was he exposed fake news. But there's something even below that. It's fake science. It's these narratives. Who manufactures narratives? And the idea is to go expose that. And I think I, I'm the, uh, probably the best person to do it. I think I have, at this point, 
the right set of skills, and I've been battle hardened on how to do this. And and uh, we wish you all, we wish you yeah. all the best on your endeavor, Dr. Ayadre. And uh, I think you're going to go through the process. Like you know, you may have some primaries to go through before you become the. Well, they're good. Yeah, there's a primary which will be in September 2020. But we're going to be putting volunteers on the ground. And uh, we're going to build again, as we did last time, a, a, a grassroots campaign. But it's really going to be focused on the worker, on the working people, because those people ultimately are the ones who have to pay something for all this fake science and this alarmism. They either have to pay more carbon tax, more property tax, be it not only climate change, anything. So the taxes ultimately go to the small person, some, some way that they extract wealth from the masses. Now, I want to just uh, hone in on the amount of money that is required to do all these things. At what point does the Democratic Party funds kick in for you? Well, if I win the primary, they should, right? All right. So the, until then, uh, I'm sorry. To, so my point is up until then, essentially, you are using the public donations and your own personal funds. Yep. This is a steep, steep hill to climb. And I think I would urge our viewers to think about this. And, and a man of his stature, Dr. Ayadur's stature, belongs in the Senate. And, and I think we should, we as the citizens of the United States should make that happen. Thank you, sir. Yeah, well, one thing, Sri, on that point is that we, you know, we only raised about $150,000. We got 70 cents per vote. vote. We got close to 100,000 votes without getting on that debate stage. The last independent who ran who was allowed on the debate stage, he only got 20,000 votes. We got five times more. If I'd been put on that debate stage, I know I would have got a half a million votes. Elizabeth Warren spent about $30 per vote. So wow. as an entrepreneur, I know how to stretch a dollar like 100x. <laughs> and and your, your dollar will be well spent. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ayadre. We'll be back for more such enlightening debates. Thank you. Thank you.